Welcome to another episode of In My City, where we sit down with business owners, community organizations, and influencers. We find out what they're doing in their community as well as their goods and services. We have a great episode for you today. We're going to be sitting down with a very special guest host, and we'll be talking about the fears of tomorrow's future. We'll be right back. People keep telling me to vote, but I really don't see why. I'm an adult. Don't tell me what to care about. I've always been comfortable living with other people's decisions. Oh, my parents got this covered. They're voting, and we've never disagreed. If my candidate isn't perfect, then I'd just rather not. It is literally impossible for one person to make a difference. Unless you're like a doctor or Beyonce or something. Well, I'm not gonna go out, I'm still quarantining. Mail in, like mail mail? Like snail mail? Does that mean I have to lick it? Where do you put the stamp? You know, this is America and I have the right and the freedom to choose not to choose who's in charge of America. It's my, it's my right as an American. I know this. I already know who my state is going to choose, so what's the point? It's raining. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if Today's a good day for that. I'm just not that into politics. Leave me alone. I'm really saying something by not doing anything. It's really gonna be decided by the Illuminati anyway. Look, I know I'm on the right side of history. I just, I don't feel like I really need to be a part of history. Does that make sense? Yo, millennials make up roughly one third of voting eligible Americans. But less than half of us voted in 2016. Oh my God, really? I'm not great at math, but that's not good. Yeah. It's never been more important to fight for what you believe in. It's time to show up. Take two minutes to register online to vote today. And then, you know, actually vote. No more excuses. No more. It's our turn. It's our turn. Our turn. Our turn. Welcome back, everyone. I'm going to use this time now to introduce our special guest host, David Vine. David Vine is a professor of political anthropology at American University in Washington, D.C. David is the author of Base Nation, How U.S. Military Bases Abroad Harm America and the World, and Island of Shame, The Secret History of the U.S. Military Base on Diego Garcia. David is also the author of his new book, The United States of War, a global history of America's endless conflict from Columbus to the Islamic State. This book has been published by the University of California Press, and it has been published this month in October. A proposal for this book won the 2018 University of California Press Series in the Public Anthropology International Book Competition. Please, everyone, welcome David Vine. Hey, David. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, it's so great to have you here. This is such a great treat for me as well as an honor. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's a treat and honor for me. <laughs> How are you? How are you guys? David's in the West Coast, so we have a three hour difference here. So I am really, really um, just glad that he's here with us today because um, he's very, very busy. For him to take the time out is extremely humbling for me. So thank you, David. No, it's a pleasure. <laughs> so, David. Let's go right into the interview. Um, I want you to first um, summarize your first two books and then tell me um, why um, this third book was so necessary. Sure. I didn't think all that much about war before mm -hmm. I got a very lucky phone call 19 years ago, almost to this day. It was wow. actually the, the summer before 9-11. So August 2001, but literally about a month before the attacks of 9-11, mm -hmm. I was in graduate school living in Brooklyn. I was doing research about gentrification and the mm -hmm. displacement related to gentrification, the people who get forced from their homes when prices rise in, in neighborhoods like, like the one I was living in in Brooklyn. Yes. And I got this very lucky phone call from a lawyer who was rep representing a group of people called the Chagosians. 
And they were, I'd never heard of them. Most people in the United States have never heard of them. They were a group of people who once lived on a group of islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean, especially on an island called Diego Garcia, mm-hmm. where there are some people watching and listening might know there's a very large U.S. military base. The only reason the base exists is because in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the U.S. and British governments forcibly removed the entire Chagosian people from their homes. They kicked them out of their homeland. They deported them about 1,200 miles away and left them there without any resettlement assistance. Wow. Uh, the, The lawyer that called me that lucky day in August 2001 told me this story that I had heard nothing about. I vaguely knew there was a military base on Diego Garcia, but knew nothing about the Chagosians and how they had been exiled. And the lawyer was calling me because he was looking for a graduate student to do some research. Uh, I was more than happy to help when he explained what had happened. And you know, immediately I felt, as the title of my book later would, would say, ashamed for wow. The role my government, our government, played in in exiling the Chagosians. So I ended up doing some research, documenting the effects of expulsion on the Chagosians' lives, documenting what it meant to to lose their homeland for them, mm-hmm. in in every sense. And then what grew out of that work for the lawyers was ultimately a a dissertation, a thesis for my PhD, and then what wow. became a, a book, Island of Shame. One of the strange things about writing the book about Diego Garcia and writing about the Chagosians was I was writing a book about a military base that I could not see. If you're not in the U.S. military, you cannot go to Diego Garcia. Uh, Only people, yeah, only people in the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Air Force can go there. Uh, Some members of the British military can go as well, but civilians have been barred from going there for now almost 40 years. I wonder uh, why. Hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, there are things that, that they clearly want to keep secret, and they like having total control of these islands without the local indigenous people, without the Chagosians there. The Chagosians have been trying to get back to their homeland now um, since, they were, since they were expelled, so now for more than half a, half a century. Um, so I, I wrote this book about an island and a base I couldn't see, which made me interested in the larger collection of military bases that the United States maintains around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, Learning about Diego Garcia really opened my eyes to this huge collection of military bases that that the U.S. military maintains in countries worldwide. And that led me to want to learn more about these bases that I, again, had thought very little about. I knew something that the U.S. military having bases in Germany and Japan and South Korea. But after I finished my first book, I I began research about, rather than just the one base, the entire network of bases around the world. And that's what led to the book Base Nation, which uh, casts light on this collection of what's now around 800 U.S. military bases outside the 50 states in Washington, D.C. Yes, 800. 800. 800. It's more military bases than any country or empire or or people in world history has had outside their own territory. And the United States has been building military bases abroad, building military bases outside U.S. territory basically since independence. But Mm -hmm. this really gigantic collection of bases only got its birth in World War II and and has been in existence since since World War II. And so in my book, Base Nation, I take a look at, at, at all these bases and what they're doing in the world, why the United States has them, do we need them, how much do they cost, what effects are they having, are they, often people say they're, they're, they're essential to ensuring U.S. national security, but very, it's been quite rare for people to, to demonstrate that, to, to question that assumption. So the book asks, you know, are these bases protecting us? Are there better ways to protect us? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are the costs? We're, else could we be investing the money? And how are these bases affecting local people like the Chagosians or other people living right next to the bases in Germany and Japan and South Korea and Honduras and uh, on, on territory around the world? Wow, that is amazing. Um, 
And I, so did you actually, and I'm, I'm going to ask this question. Did you see this and, and correct me if I'm wrong, if I can even call it this, did you see these books actually being a trilogy? Because that's what, how I look at it, how you took me from the very beginning, just like you said, your dissertation of, of, um, a people being dispelled from their land to actually doing your, um, your second book on just being more the, the broader, um, aspect of them and what was going on. And, and, and then your third book going to where else are we doing these things at? Did you actually have that planned out or was it just from just what you've experienced that you're like, I just need to know more. I wish I could say there were some grand vision from the beginning, but no, I, you know, I, I, I pretty much wrote each book uh, focused on the immediate task at hand. Uh, the, you know, the first book, Island of Shame, emerged out of, as you said, my dissertation. And then I just sort of said, there, there is more I want to know and understand. And I also, you know, based on the history of Diego Garcia alone, but also seeing that the U.S. military has displaced other people during the creation of of U.S. military bases abroad, I had my concerns about this collection of bases around the world. Uh, so that led me to want to, to, again, to, to cast light on this situation and, and bring, bring the, the situation uh, of this huge collection of bases around the world to the attention of people in the United States in particular. And then I, when I finished Base Nation, I initially... I think I just realized that there was something bigger, that in a certain sense, the first book was about one base, the second book was about the 800 military bases around the world, right. and then the bigger system of war was what I wanted to take on next, and, and not just take on in the sense of understanding it, although, like you said, part of it was just a desire to educate myself better, to mm -hmm. sort of um, free myself from some of the history, the sort of nationalist myths of, of history that we get taught in mm -hmm. elementary school, middle school, high school, college yeah. even. Uh, but I also wanted to do something. I wanted to write a book that would have some impact in the world, especially given, you know, it goes back to that, that phone call or shortly after that phone call in 2001. Mm -hmm. The United States has been fighting wars constantly since 9-11. And the destruction that these wars have inflicted on people, again, in, in places around the world, but especially, of course, in Afghanistan and Iraq and Pakistan, uh, in Syria and Yemen and Somalia and, and other places where the United States has waged this so-called war on terror. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The destruction has been immense. And, and to say that I'm ashamed of what our government has done is, is an understatement. And I, hear you. I think, you know, it's my belief that there is a systemic problem. And it's a problem that through my research, I realized it's, it's not just a problem of the Bush administration, the George W. Bush administration, or yeah. the Obama administration that followed, or President Trump that followed President Obama. It is a, a, an even bigger problem. It's a problem of a, a, an entire system of war that dates to the independence of the United States. And, and actually, the, as I show in, in this new book, The United States of War, it's a problem that dates to the arrival of Columbus in the Americas when he arrived in, of all places, Guantanamo Bay in 1494, uh, which, of course, th that alone was a surprise to me. I, I, when I learned that, that Columbus showed up at Guantanamo Bay, this place that has been so associated with the war on terror and the prison there, I was shocked. And mm. suddenly it seemed to me that, wait a second, this isn't just a coincidence. This says something nope. bigger about the, the longer term patterns of war. It is so amazing. And I'm so grateful that you said that, that it is a, it's a, it's a uh, systemic problem. Um, one of the things that um, David and I have already shared um, while going over his book earlier was how his book was an eye opener for me and how terrifying, and I told him it was a compliment, how terrifying it was for me to read this book because it 
gave me more knowledge about the going ons of what we've been doing as 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 um as the Americas, as in the military bases displacing people all the time. This is not anything new. The how many we have, which to me is very ridiculous in itself, but just how many we have and how we were talking about earlier, um, in which I'm going to get ready to read a passage out of, how we've you've gone to these different countries and set up camp there and you've just just put yourself there and put yourself there the way how you want it to. Meaning that let's say that you come over to my house as a friend and you're 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 visiting and one of the things like like I love that you said David leasing. You come over to my place and I let you just spend the night or let's say you're spending a month with me and you want to rearrange my furniture because you want it the way how you want it. It's how I felt like the United States militaries have gone into all these different countries and done what they wanted to do, set up land how they wanted to. And I'm about to read that to you in a second. And I just find how it's just so disrespectful in that way. And, and David, do you agree? I do, and, and that actually was one of the main aims of, of the book, Base Nation, to ask you did a people, great job. And thank <laughs> you, to, to ask people to think about how they would feel if there was a foreign military base on our soil, if they were living next to a Chinese military base, hmm. if they were li living next to a Russian military base, or even a military base belonging to a U.S. ally, mm -hmm. like Britain or France. How would it feel to be living side by side with foreign soldiers? And this is the situation that people in countries around the world, now about 80 countries and territories, colonies around the world are hosting U.S. military bases. So there are people every day living side by side with, with members of the U.S. military. Now, met, often people are quite happy to have members of the U.S. military living in their towns, their communities. But at the same time, often there are a lot of tensions between local yeah. communities and the, the U.S. military presence. Yeah. Um, sometimes it can be both. It can be a combination of some, some beautiful relationships, but then right. some very destructive ones. You know, the, as, as many people probably know, in, in Okinawa, Japan in particular, mm -hmm. there have been a long pattern of crimes committed by U.S. military personnel um, mm -hmm. very tragically, um, leading to rapes, murders, um, theft, a uh, whole range of crimes that Okinawans have been paying very close attention to, just like we would if there was a foreign military on our soil and they were committing crimes. And actually, one of the things I do in the new book, The United States of War, is I point out that when what is now the United States when it was occupied by British troops prior mm -hmm. to the independence of the United States, this is exactly one of the reasons that people in what is today the United States wanted independence, yes. because they were being occupied by these foreign troops yes. who were committing yes. crimes, including rape and murder and theft, just like mm -hmm. we're seeing today. So um, one of the things I, I, I do try to, in, in some ways in all my books, but especially in Base Nation, is to get people to try to put themselves in the shoes of, of others. And, and ask, how would I feel if I had a, a, a foreign military base in my town, in my city, in my community? Just one more thing that, especially for people watching or listening in Florida, that might resonate. The former president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, really highlighted this dynamic powerfully and, and quite funnily um, when he said uh, there, there used to be a U.S. military base in Ecuador and its lease was coming up for renewal in 2009, he said mm -hmm. to some journalists, we are happy to renew this lease on the U.S. military base in, in Monta, Ecuador, but mm -hmm. only on one condition, that the United States allows us, Ecuador, to put a military base in Miami. <laughs> and of course, you know, most people in the United States couldn't conceive of an Ecuadorian military base being in Miami. Uh, but that, that, I think, you know, highlights the sort of double standard that we often see where the United States military and the United States government uses its power in ways that it wishes and assumes that everyone else will go along with it. Um, mm -hmm. I should just say one other thing because I'm, I'm sure many 
people listening, watching, have members of their family in the military or that perhaps they themselves have been in the military. Yeah. All my work is, is quite critical of U.S. military policy, as, as people can probably already tell. But I make an important distinction between critiquing U.S. military policy or U.S. government policy and critiquing members of the military. The idea behind my books is not to slam you know, members of the military as evil or terrible people, but right. instead to look, as you said, at, at the systemic problems that are bigger than any one person. Um, and in, indeed, I was extraordinarily lucky to get to visit U.S. military bases in, in different parts of the world and meet tremendous members of the U.S. military on the bases, as well as members of local communities. Um, and, and, and often it's members of the military themselves who are as critical as anyone of what the U.S. military is doing around the world. Yeah. But I do think it's important to, to draw that distinction between critiquing U.S. military policy and U.S. war policy and critiquing individuals. And that, that's not, my, I'm not interested in critiquing individuals as individuals with the exception of a few extraordinarily powerful people like President Trump, among others. <laughs> I love it, David. Guys, we're actually going to take a quick break. And when we come back, you'll have a treat. I'll be reading a passage from David's new book. We'll be right back, guys. Stay tuned.